lecture 14 changing your grade is because the bottom part of the class drops, so that doesn't influence your position. But anyway, really a lot of good performance, and I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end. Uh, the, I keep getting emails and forget to announce in class that uh, the syllabus had their own date for the final exam on it. It said Tuesday, December 6th. It should have said Tuesday, December 4th. Um, so that's the official date for the university for our final exam. It's just the final is just the unit four exam, so it's 75 minutes. I always have students concerned that they have to get back to Boca for a, um, another exam that afternoon. Uh, it, you'll be out of here by the normal time, 11.45, and I think the next exam starts at 1 or something. So uh, even with horrible traffic, you should get back to Boca. Um, so, uh, starting, actually, we kind of introduced it with uh, electrophysiology, but we're going into the nervous system, neurophysiology, for the remainder of the class. And so that's uh, half of the first semester, or 25% of the whole class, which isn't unusual. The nervous system encompasses the, one of the largest of all organ systems, and it's very complex. So. It's not unusual in any course uh, to spend at least a quarter of it on nervous uh, system. So we'll be doing that um, in this unit. We'll introduce general uh, concepts as far as uh, the organization of the system and then talk about the sensory uh, system. And so today we'll begin with uh, synaptic transmission. I've got some eye clicker questions like I usually do just to that you're thinking about things scattered in the lecture, uh, but they only count for participation. Let's see if you're awake, I guess. Okay. Um, the, uh, today we're going to talk about synapses, and this material's in Born and Volpape's uh, chapter. Synapses are the functional connection between neurons, and it uh, comes from a direct a Greek derivative that means connect or join, so it makes sense. And so when uh, neurons or sensory structures uh, relay information to other neurons, what happens is the, uh, that information is connected, conducted from one cell to another across a specialized junction, which we call a synapse. Um, there are two general classes of synapses. Electrical synapses are essentially a low resistance pathway so that the so that the signal can go from uh, one cell to another just by the action potential kind of leaping from cell to cell. And that occurs commonly in cardiac cells and smooth cells, as I said before, through gap cap junction. So uh, these cells don't have to be individually innervated. If you activate one smooth muscle cell, it sweeps across the whole Organ. So uh, this is uh, electrical synapse in the classification of gap junctions. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. The other more classic type of junction that you usually hear about are chemical synapses. And this is when uh, one neuron connects to its next neuron in sequence. And these are uh, polarized junctions. In other words, the Communication always comes from what we call presynaptic ending to the postsynaptic ending. It's only uh, one directional, where uh, electrical is bi directional. And the presynaptic ending uh, releases chemicals, and those chemicals alter the function of the postsynaptic, call it motor plate and, and, or ending, and 
change its activity. So uh, the communication is slower and needs uh, chemicals referred to as neurotransmitters. The uh, synapse we first studied in detail was the neuromuscular junction. And the reason that it's studied so much is it's very accessible. It's not, we didn't have to go into the dorsal cavity, into the cranium, or through the spinal cord, uh, through the vertebrae. We could just reach it at peripheral sites. And it's fairly large as junctions go. So it was obviously easy to be studied, much easier than any other synapse. So most of our initial information about synaptic function came from this neuromuscular junction. These days, however, a lot of work is being done on central motor neuron connections, central nervous, uh, excuse me, central nervous system connections. Um, these uh, neuromuscular junction is a synapse between what we call a motor neuron we've talked about before and a single muscle cell or muscle fiber. fiber. And uh, that connection, there's one of those per each cell, once again. And it consists of the motor neuron coming towards the cell and then branching out. This is a nice superior looking down on the junction from on top, showing the branching that occurs at the motor neuron ending. And there, at that ending in the we call it presynaptic side, are... Uh, are multiple vesicles, and these vesicles contain the, the neurotransmitter chemicals. So, and many, many uh, little uh, stored uh, vesicles, each containing some of that neurotransmitter. And this this uh, nice uh, that postjunctional membrane looks like it has many folds, and on all these folds are multiple receptors, which here are represented as those those uh, green dots. So there's a tremendous amount of surface area that allows uh, increased possibility that that chemical unites with some receptor. Thank you. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. There we go. Good. Thank you. Sorry to bother you. <laughs> okay. Um, the um, on, on a neuromuscular junction, this post-junctional uh, surface is called a motor end plate or end plate. In a, in a uh, nervous uh, synapse, it would be just called the postsynaptic membrane. But in neuromuscular junctions, we usually call this the motor end plate that's on the uh, sarcolemma of the uh, uh, muscle cell. So, just to begin with the very simplest uh, introduction to the steps of neuromuscular uh, conduction, uh, the action potential, which we spent a lot of time talking about in the last unit, is conducted down the motor neuron that reaches the presynaptic terminal. And what happens there is it depolarizes some uh, voltage-gated calcium channels. And that's indicated here on this figure by number one. And these uh, open up as, there, as the membranes depolarize and increase the conductance, my G symbol uh, for conductance, so elevate the conductance to calcium through those channels. And so calcium rushes in, of course, down its very uh, high gradient, concentration gradient, about a hundredfold gradient, and increases the presynaptic endings calcium concentration. This leads to, and we'll go into this in detail in a second, a uh, series of changes that end up releasing the stored chemical or those little uh, synaptic vesicles. And they, then the chemical diffuses across the cleft and they're couples to uh, a ligand-gated receptor. And there's all kinds of these receptors, which we'll talk about off and on during the class. But this is a ligand-gated receptor. In the case of neuromuscular junctions, these are the receptors on the motor end plate. And when the ligand couples to that receptor, it makes them uh, permeable to cations, usually uh, both uh, sodium and potassium. This is the classic acetylcholine uh, neurotransmitter, which is the neuromuscular junction uh, mediator. So all neuromuscular junctions 
the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. When acetylcholine hooks to its receptor, it equally increases conduction to both sodium and potassium. And that induces what we call an end plate potential. EPP stands for end plate potential, which is a depolarization of sarcolemma. So it's just like a threshold simulation. The, the uh, muscle uh, membrane depolarizes from minus 80, whatever it is, millivolts, on down to minus 30 or minus 50. And that causes an action potential. And uh, that action potential will... Uh, open up other voltage-gated sodium channels, so uh, it will be conducted all the way through the, the cell. In fact, down those T-tubules, it's represented here by number four, and there it opens up the calcium channels down there, the, what we call the, the uh, voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, uh, or DFP channels. And then that opens physically the ryanidine receptor and calcium rushes out. So we went, those are all those events of excitation, contraction, coupling that we've already been through. So if you want to turn on your eye filters, just to think about those things which we talked about up to now. Uh, curare is an extract from plants that has been used for centuries on uh, uh, the Indians used it to coat the tips of their arrows to stop their uh, uh, prey from running away and on and on. So it's been used for many, many years as a toxin in hunting. And it binds to the acetylcholine receptor we were just talking about. And acetylcholine once can't bind to that uh, motor end plate receptor if it's already uh, occupied by curare. So it blocks access to acetylcholine to that receptor. So this would stop the events after one of these. So if you go down A, B, C, D, which event will not occur in the Fred's vestibulum? Go ahead and start the little. This is just participation. Just to, if you think about what we've been talking about very simply. Okay, so I have this set of 45 seconds, so four seconds left, three, okay. Wow, <laughs> the old uh, random response. Uh, with curare present, the motor neuron will function fine. It doesn't affect uh, the motor neuron's response. What happens is the calcium will enter the presynaptic ending, the acetylcholine will be exocytosed, but the receptors will be occupied by curare, so there won't be any end plate potential. So the first step blocked would be letter D. There would be no end plate potential. Uh, when they use it hunting, the animal starts running and then you get the flow and flow until he falls over because his muscles won't, won't work. In fact, the diaphragm doesn't work, so they'll uh, die of, uh, of lack of respiration. So anyway, that uh, uh, curare is a toxin for the neuromuscular junction. Okay. A little bit more about the release from uh, presynaptic endings of these neurotransmitters. There has been a lot of study of this in detail. And this is the subject of controlled exocytosis, or it's also called receptor-mediated exocytosis. But again, this is just a more detailed drawing. So here's the action potential coming down the motor neuron. It opens up the calcium, and the calcium rushes into the uh, terminal, axon terminal. The calcium binds to almost always when calcium is elevated in uh, within cells, it binds to some a binding protein, divalent di, uh, di uh, calcium chelator. And these proteins with uh, potassium bound often together alter function, and that's what happens here. It binds to a calcium binding co 
uh, compound that leads from docking of vesicles to fusion. In other words, it uh, changes the nature of these uh, proteins, these uh, linking proteins such that they're fused. I got a better uh, um, figure in the next slide. And so it causes the vesicles, uh, actually they fuse earlier dock, but the fusion, the process that leave is just before excitosis requires these uh, snare complex proteins. Uh, so here's a little bit more detail. So the excitosis membranes, the vesicles are produced, the neurotransmitter vesicles are produced uh, within uh, Golgi apparatus and then travel down to the presynaptic endings where they'll dock and they'll specifically dock by proteins that are integral proteins as part of the membrane called snare proteins. And the calcium causes a conformational change in the snare proteins where first they just grab onto and hold a vesicle, they call it docking, but the fusion that precedes the exocytosis occurs when calcium changes the conformation of these uh, snare proteins. And there's all kinds of synaptotagments indicated here, and I'm not gonna have you worry about learning them. In, in uh, cell biology, uh, they spend a lot of time on the subject, and we'll talk about the different snare proteins and their function, but that's really uh, not important for us at this time. But the, but the calcium, all I would like you to know is calcium changes the configuration of those snare proteins such that exocytosis occurs. So it's calcium-mediated exocytosis, which is a very common way that not only neurotransmitters are released, but also a lot of chemicals such as hormones, a lot of hormones are released by uh, calcium-mediated exocytosis. And we'll, so we'll refer to it off and on during the class. Often the, the membranes for those vesicles ends up part of the presynaptic ending, as you can see, and then it ends up being folded back up by another group of uh, membranes and reused to make um, more vesicles. So the whole system is very uh, frugal in using all the parts again, a lot of recycling going on. So don't worry about learning the fusion proteins or the snares as far as there's all kinds of, just like you to know the calcium triggers the exocytosis process and it involves changing conformation of these proteins. Uh, we've got, a lot of what we know is because of these toxins, as I said repeatedly, and then a the couple of toxins that affects this exocytotic process. One of them is botulinum, which you've probably heard of, and another is a tetanus toxin, and both of them uh, block the snare complex, and, and so docking and fusion and neurotransmitter release don't occur. And, and there's a nice figure I put in here about how botulinum toxin is taken into the cell and then part of that toxin breaks up or um, fractures the snare proteins so that they won't dock and even fuse. So anyway, what happens is in botulism poisoning, uh, the patient in early stages uh, loses smooth muscle activity and vomiting and diarrhea and so forth. Eventually paralysis of the respiratory muscles will cause death. So it's obviously a very uh, serious problem. You've probably heard about the use of botulinum, however, uh, for cosmetic uses. And this is very small concentrations uh, uh, injected into the site where you want the activity to, done, to be used. So in very, very low concentrations, it can be used to some benefit. Uh, tetanus toxin, in contrast, uh, only seems to have, uh, attack a certain family of cells within the central nervous system, particularly in the spinal cord, and these are inhibitory neurons. So unlike uh, botulinum, uh, tetanus causes uh, the opposite. These are inhibitory neurons, and so you have profound uh, excitation. So the patient has so many, the reflexes get more and more extreme and can end up in spasms or tetany, and hence the name. So the opposite effect because you're uh, blocking exocytosis of inhibitory neurotransmitters, a subject we'll be talking about in the future. We also often have both a balance between excitation and inhibition in the system and tetanus 
affects the inhibitory release. Uh, some, of, some of us, especially uh, up north here in, in our northern campus, have a more use of this uh, toxin. A little bit of negative, uh, neg negative boca comment. Okay, uh, the I was talking about how uh, how I, I'm trying to think where it works, but how we recycle the system and it's very uh, uh, frugal, I guess is the word I'm trying to get to, and it's used as the element. So not only do we recycle the membranes from the vesicles, but also the neurotransmitters themselves. And there's another purpose of this. So out in the, we call it synaptic cleft, the space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane, there's an awful lot of this enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And its purpose is to digest or degrade acetylcholine. And so it breaks it up, as you see, as you see there, into acetate and choline. Um, and there's two purposes. One is uh, you, you don't want that reaction to keep going on. In other words, instead of having a muscle twitch and then relaxation, if you kept the muscle activated, you keep having contraction and contraction. So every uh, reflex has to have something that shuts it off. And this shuts that acetylcholine off, takes it off the receptor and, and reverses the effect. And so that's acetylcholinesterase that does that. Another advantage of the system is these uh, breakdown products of, ast of acetylcholine are taken back into the cell and reused and the synthesis of more acetylcholine. So it uh, stops or limits the response plus um, it, uh, you, we reuse the byproduct. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the acetylcholinesterase digests the neurotransmitter. Some of it never even makes it to the receptor. This is talking about the nicotinic receptor, which is what's on the muscle membrane. We'll talk about that later. But some of the acetylcholine release diffuses away from the uh, active side, the motor end plate, and never even activates it. But the uh, majority ends up being degraded either on the way to the uh, receptor or after binding to receptor by acetylcholinesterase. We have some some uh, inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase we can also use to study the system. Neostigmine and bisostigmine are pharmacological agents that inhibit acetylcholinesterase. And if you gave them in a uh, healthy person, you'd end up with increase in incidence of tetania, prolonged muscle contraction and even death, so they're very, uh, uh, can be definitely very toxic agents. In fact, uh, I always tell a story, uh, many years ago, uh, this was the preferred way that physicians would kill their wives. Uh, extreme small amount of physostigmine can be injected into a person and it's metabolized very rapidly, so it's very hard for a toxicologist or pathologist to figure out the cause of death. It looks like a person died from some respiratory failure, which was actually a spasm of the diaphragm. It's hard to diagnose the reason, uh, but uh, we do have increasing ability to find it. I have some in my office if you have someone. You know. <laughs> With for you know money, I can always help you. Anyway, uh, so these are drugs that would cause tetany and death, but they do have some therapeutic value. Again, there's a disease called myasthenia gravis, and in this disease, uh, as in many autoimmune diseases, our own immune system attacks the receptors for acetylcholine, so they start degrading, and you'll have fewer and fewer receptors for acetylcholine. And then people with this very serious disease, they gradually get weaker and weaker muscle activity occurs over a long period of time. And as their muscles get weaker and weaker, they're able to do less as far as get around their environment and so forth. Well, if you give them uh, physostigmine or neostigmine in small amounts, that prolongs the acetylcholine and it'll help to overcome the muscle weakness and fatigue in early stages of the disease. So it's useful because it prolongs acetylcholine being available for the few receptors that are there. <laughs>
So that's uh, kind of an introduction to chemical synapses. Like to talk about uh, electrical synapses for a while. Electrical synapses, uh, molecularly, we've talked about them uh, before, uh, consist of these essentially columns between two cells. Uh, the, uh, unlike a chemical um, synapse that has a delay, mostly because of diffusion time of the chemical, uh, electrical synapses have no synaptic delay, instant uh, communication from one cell to another. And as I've already said, the uh, communication occurs bidirectionally from one cell to another, vice versa, where uh, chemical synapses can only occur presynaptic to postsynaptic cells. Uh, they're composed of six subunits. The whole uh, unit's called a connexon. Uh, the uh, subunits are called connexins, and each individual connexin, pictured here is this purple bar, is a peptide uh, that's mostly an alpha helical peptide that extends the integral protein that extends all the way through the membrane. Spontaneously, these coalesce into units of six. It ends up forming a, a channel through the, the uh, bimolecular leaflet as pictured here. And then these line up end to end between two cells. So you have an opening essentially between the two cells. The reason we originally called them gap junctions was because they force a gap between cells of 35 angstroms because of their structure. So the gap came from the fact that the two membranes coupled the gap junctions are held apart by this 35 <coughs> angstrom space due to the structure of the connexins. Uh, that when they're clustered in large arrays, for example, in the um, heart, we call them intercalated discs but often they're so scattered that they're just gap junctions that are hard to um, see in anything under light microscopy. But in the cardiac muscle, you can see them. They make a very dark blotch between cardiac cells. So they call them intercalated discs. Um, uh, small molecules, less than 1.2 um, thousand Daltons are permeable through these structures. So small signaling molecules, like cyclic AMP and so forth, very small molecules can get through these gap junctions, and hence the cytoplasm of the adjoining cells are uh, pretty identical. However, their most important value is it allows electrical continuity. So if an action potential occurs in one cell, it immediately occurs in the next cell. And hence, we, as term I've already mentioned to you, refer to cells that are coupled by gap junctions to being part of a functional syncytium, a fancy word that means one cell acts just like or the whole, all the cells coupled together um, respond equally or identically. And so functionally the cells, the multiple cells are just like one huge cell. When I had this course and when I initially taught this course, uh, some three centuries ago, we knew of gap junctions only in smooth and cardiac muscle. And so that's all we taught. But since then, we've, we've found gap junctions all over the place. And I'll refer to them off and on to the class. So although we first thought they only existed in those two muscle families, we know they're in invertebrate neurons. But now we've also found them in a whole variety of glial cells. And we'll talk about glial cells, I think, in the next lecture. Uh, uh, CNS synapses, osteocytes. I mentioned already the um, projections from osteocytes are connected by gap junctions. Um, there is a, several groups of our faculty working on gap junctions uh, because they play a role in development. Uh, as the neurons going out from their early undifferentiated cells start trying to move through our system during development, gap junctions play a big role in finding their uh, connections. So gap junctions are sometimes only present for a part of the stage of the cell, but they're being found, uh, found to be an important part of all cells activity, I think, as we progress along the story. Okay, a little bit more uh, about uh, the physiology of, of uh, 
synapses, just trying to build the story slowly. Um, uh, we just talked about, up to now, uh, neuromuscular junction, and overall how neuromuscular junctions work, but uh, there are junctions not only between muscles and nerves, of course, but between nerves, and they vary tremendously in the neurotransmitter release. There's a whole groups of neurotransmitters, and I'll talk about them in generality very soon. And not only that, but often these neurotransmitters work on different receptor classes. So you'll hear the story of nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, both for acetylcholine. You'll hear about alpha and beta receptors for the catecholamines. So not only are there different neurotransmitters, but there's different receptors, and these receptors generate different signaling cascades. So the whole story of, of uh, synaptic function is quite complex. Uh, the uh, receptor density varies. The population of receptors on a given cell can be variable. Some of them only have alpha, some of them only have beta. That's usually the case. Uh, but the, the density of receptors changes continually. We up and down regulate receptor population and what they do inside the cell depends often not only on the receptor class, but on the cell it's in. So it's an opportunity for signal modulation and integration. In other words, uh, the fact that we have this one signaling mechanism doesn't mean only one response occurs. We can have tremendous number of responses occur in response to release of one uh, uh, neurotransmitter for a very simple uh, um, example of that is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine in one case will cause muscle contraction, but the same molecule will cause relaxation of another muscle. So, tremendous opportunity for different uh, for a signal to have different responses in different uh, organ systems. Another um, characteristic of nervous. Uh, uh, transmission or synapses in the nervous system is the delay. The delay is predominantly because of the conduction time between release of the uh, neurotransmitter and hooking to the receptor. So most of the synaptic delay, although there's a component, component of calcium coming into the presynaptic terminal, release of the neurotransmitter, by far, my little star there is most of the synaptic delay is due to the time it takes for diffusion um, of the neurotransmitter. That's the slowest part of the whole system. I've already said it's unidirectional. Uh, and another thing which we usually do on this lecture is divide the uh, responses of neurotransmitters into two very large families, and it's quite useful and that's inotropic and metabolotropic type of, of receptor classes. And it's not a very hard concept, but it's very useful when we start talking about neurotransmitter families. And the inotropic uh, receptor is one that opens up or increases conduction through a channel. So it's, it works through a ligand-gated channel. So the ligand couples to the integral protein and it increases or decreases in some cases conduction. So it alters uh, uh, conduction through some uh, channel of ions, charged uh, ions, either sodium or potassium or chloride, calcium, those are the main major ions we're talking about. And it could, it produces what we call a postsynaptic potential. In other words, at the postsynaptic membrane, it changes the resting membrane potential. And you notice I didn't say depolarizes or uh, hyperpolarizes because both occur. We call them excitatory and, and inhibitory. But the postsynaptic potential is just the change in membrane potential that occurs at the postsynaptic membrane. Um, the responses of inotropic uh, signaling compared to metabolotropic signaling are much, much faster. So although there's a delay, again, mostly because that's a choline or whatever the transmitter release has to fuse, the delay is in milliseconds. Uh, I'm going to talk about metabolotropic signaling and it's much, much slower, talking minutes and sometimes longer. So 
Another characteristic of inotropic signaling is it's relatively fast. And an example is the acetylcholine receptors. This stands for acetylcholine receptor. It's an inotropic type mechanism. This, this is representing that it increases conduction of, of sodium potassium through the postsynaptic membrane. Uh, I already mentioned this very briefly, but the postsynaptic potential can either be hyperpolarized or depolarized by these changes in conduction. If it's hyperpolarized, we call it inhibitory postsynaptic potential, which because it's such a tongue twister, we always say IPSP. And if it depolarizes, we call it an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an EPSP. I'll be using those terms, the abbreviations, much more frequently than the uh, long explanation. Uh, just as a side comment, because some of you will ask me later, uh, there's also EPPs, that stands for end plate potential. So if you're talking about neuromuscular junction, we usually say EPP or excitatory uh, end plate or motor plate uh, potential. But uh, what we're usually talking about is central nervous system, so it's EPSP or IPSP. This is a, a uh, actual recording, supposedly, of an IPSP, which would take a cell at, say, at minus 50, minus 60 to minus 80 or 90, so it's hyperpolarized. And excitatory would go the other way, it would depolarize the cell. I already said that. Okay, metabotropic signaling. Uh, the neurotransmitter in this case couples its cell ligand for receptor itself, but once it's bound to that receptor, it starts what we call a signaling cascade, often a multi-step process that involves intracellular kinds of intracellular factors. So the neurotransmitter binds to a receptor that initiates a cascade and then that results in some, you know, receptive cell change in activity and all kinds of change in activity. This is a very slow process because it involves many, many uh, different changes. Often it involves protein synthesis and can take hours, it lasts for days. So usually it has a long duration but a very slow initiation response. And the muscarinic responses there's a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor in this family. Uh, so the acetylcholine binds the receptor, and in this case, this is a G-protein response. So this is called a G-protein receptor. Hopefully you've been introduced to G-proteins. But G-proteins have a membrane-bound or integral protein that, that couples to the ligand, and then coupled to that is the G-protein, which is usually a trimeric protein. And once the receptors activated, that usually leads to dissociation of the G-protein subunits. In this case, the beta-gamma subunit couples to a channel. In this case, uh, the channel uh, allows uh, potassium. It's called a, uh, it's not even listed, but yeah, here it is. It's called uh, a uh, activation of a rectifier channel. Remember, usually potassium uh, goes both ways if you increase the channel, but this only allows unidirectional potassium uh, conduction, but it leads to what you'd expect, hyperpolarization. More potassium leaves the, the cell, and the cell gets even more polarized than it normally is. So that would lead to inhibition or an IPSP. I uh, just thought I'd mention, since it happened this week, actually, the news article I saw was yesterday the Nobel Prize for uh, chemistry was given to two fellows in the United States, uh, uh, Kobilkov and uh, Stanford, Lutkowitz and Duke, for working on G-protein receptors. So that G-protein uh, linked receptor systems, these uh, um, um, uh, G-protein uh, linked, I don't know what they call I guess they call combined receptors, yeah, combined receptors. But this family of receptors, about 50% of the drugs which we use in therapy, it's an unbelievable number, are now things that modulate G protein activity. So it was, it's been tremendously important work. Uh, 10 or 20 years ago when they discovered G proteins, there was a Nobel Prize, but this is, 
groups that have been working on these receptor or these linked proteins, and they do all kinds of things. And a lot of the therapies we now um, utilize are involved with this G protein activity. And I'll mention it off and on as we go through the rest of the class. Okay, so ionic mechanism of postsynaptic uh, potential. So what happens when with the postsynaptic potential? A lot of the EPSPs are due to an increase in cation influx or anion influx or efflux. And so a lot of them result in depolarization. Uh, so that's usually what an EPSP is. The cations either go into the cell or the anions go out. And so that hyperpolarizes the cell, I mean depolarizes the cell. And you get the little response shown here. Uh, and then that's a second eye clicker question. So let's, uh, this is what acetylcholine does in most inotropic receptor systems. It increases equally conduction of sodium potassium. So my question is, why does that lead to depolarization? Since potassium conduction should hyperpolarize and sodium should depolarize, why does the cell depolarize when you increase conduction? And actually, that was a question on the test, if you followed. So let me go ahead and start it. Answer is uh, most most of you chose C, and that's the correct answer. A better way of saying it was that the driving force for sodium is much 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 greater than potassium. It's a very simple concept, and that is, if you open up channels for both of these ions, there's no reason for potassium to hardly move. Its gradient is almost balanced. Uh, sodium wants to really go in tremendously, so. If you equally open up conductance, the cell will, you'll have a tremendous depolarization. So anyway, that's how acetylcholine works. IPSP is usually due to chloride, but it's uh, an increase in negative ion influx of potassium ion efflux. Most of the IPSPs increase chloride conductance, but not all of them. Okay, and that's the next question. How does an increase in chloride conduction result in membrane hyperpolarization? It's rather a hard question, actually. Okay, and as soon as it lets me. Oh, you guys are bright. D is the right answer. Uh, the chloride going in would increase the gradient. Uh, chloride does bind to potassium, and that decreases the potassium. Very minor effect. But definitely the way we would do it in physiology terms is the chord equation becomes Chloride, the chloride gradient becomes more important than the potassium or sodium, and it's more permeable, and so it shifts to the chloride uh, nerds potential, which is slightly more polar than the potassium. So anyway, actually, all, all ABC are correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so, uh, every cell body, and we get into this in uh, more detail later on, but every cell body is, is hooked to all kinds of presynaptic neurons. And some of them, let's say that cell has a resting memory potential of 65, some of those neurons coming in are going to be excitatory neurons going to an EPSP or depolarizing the, the nerve. And some of them are going to hyperpolarize it or inhibit it by releasing um, inhibitory neurotransmitters. And so this traffic is all, always coming in on all our multipolar neurons, as we'll discuss in more detail. So this is an opportunity for integration. In other words, what happens whether well, this particularly neuron fires and sends out an action potential will depend on the relative amount of excitatory and inhibitory input. And we're going to talk about that a lot in the in the future. Uh, finally, one last little comment. Uh, if you were to put a very, very sensitive uh, voltmeter on a postsynaptic cell, you wouldn't get this kind of recording. This is a continual line. But you continually get little blips in the resting membrane potential. So if you were to put a very, very sensitive microelectrode into a neuron, any neuron in the body, the resting memory potential does not sit right at minus 60 or minus 90. It has these little blips, and they call them MEPPs. And the reason they occur is we don't hold those uh, neurotransmitters tightly in our presynaptic endings. They kind of leak out every so often. So these are little uh, leaks of presynaptic vesicles that occur constantly. And they actually increase our resting excitability, if you will. But this is how we discovered that the neurotransmitters are stored in little packets because they all have the same height. And so, again, it's less two of them are so are released at the same time. Uh, the neurotransmitters are released in little packets called uh, due to their being stored in these synaptosomes of these little vesicles. Anyway, that was the first time we, we learned, or how we learned about neurotransmitter release. Okay, uh, there was only uh, three, but I'm just going to count it five points, participation point, and that's all eye clickers. So the only other thing I wanted to do today was to talk a little bit about the exam. Oops, wrong thing. Okay, so as I indicated at the beginning, a very, very good result of the first exam. Um, the average was 68%, which is very good for that exam. Uh, I gave two points per uh, for that because I had seven.